Hello everyone, um, good afternoon um, and it's really great for to have you all here today either um, in the morning or evening depending where you're joining us from. Um, my name is David McGilvery uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the symposium that we're hosting today on sport events and human rights uh, which is hosted by the Centre for Culture, Sport and Events at University of the West of Scotland and it's part of our a European funded events right project which focuses on sport events, human rights, inclusion and diversity. Um, this project and the one that we're talking about today is a, is a consortium uh, of European and international academic and non-academic partners that, that try to visit each other um, regularly, albeit that's been obviously difficult during the, the pandemic and focus upon research into the focus of this symposium today in terms of human rights and, and major sporting events. Um, we've got lots of partners from Event Rights speaking today and participating, as well as other speakers from around, uh, along the field of sport events and human rights too. So it's a really nice, varied um, speaker list, I think. So we've got a very busy afternoon, I think, with a, a stellar list of speakers, panel members and moderators uh, going to be joining us. Uh, and I'm not going to take up too much of the time at the beginning. Just a few housekeeping issues uh, that I'm going to introduce before we go on to the keynote talk. So we're using the AirMeet platform that you've all joined today, uh, and hopefully you've all been able to navigate that successfully to get to the point where you are at the moment. Um, it is recommended to use the Chrome browser if that's possible, or there is also an AirMeet app. Uh, so if you experience any problems, then it's perhaps worth switching to those. Um, second, it's important that you can participate in the event, and that's something we're very keen on today, um, in two main ways. So you can post comments in the chat feature, which you should be able to see on your screen and also share thoughts that way. If you've got a specific question um, for the keynote or for subsequent panels that we have, then I'm going to request that you put these in the Q&A if, if that's possible. That'll help the moderators pick those out and direct them to the speakers. Now, we're quite tight on time in terms of each of our panels today. So if the panel doesn't have time to answer all the questions that have been posed, then we'll try and pull these together and, and have them addressed by the panel members and post event and share those with you. Each session is going to be recorded uh, and we'll be in touch afterwards to share how those are going to be accessible to people. Uh, the, this symposium is also sponsored by Frontiers uh, and we're delighted to announce that uh, we'll be editing a special research topic on the theme of, of uh, sport events and human rights, which is now going to be open for submissions. And we'll share the link in the chat for those that might be interested in participating and submitting to that. And now it's important to get started really with the, the schedule uh, of events for today. So first up, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Daniela Hert from the Asser Institute in The Hague, who's an expert in the field of sport and human rights, and in particular in the context of mega sporting events. Danielle conducted her PhD research on the question of how to establish legal responsibility for human rights harms that occur in the context of these events. Uh, and beyond her academic research, she also developed expertise in the field of sport and human rights, working as an independent consultant for the Centre for Sport and Human Rights, and also a European, you know, European partner, Parliament, sorry. So we're delighted to have Daniela here today, and I'm going to just hand over to Daniela uh, in a second, uh, and she's going to do a presentation, and then we'll have time at the end where there'll be an opportunity for questions. Okay, so I'll hand over to you, Daniela. Welcome to the event today. Uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and I'll come back in afterwards. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just trying to share my screen. One second. I hope that everyone can see this now. Um, Yes. Okay, that should work. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you again, David, for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers also for putting together such an uh, interesting and, and timely event. And especially for giving me the chance to open today's event and, and setting the scene for the discussions to come. Like David said, my name is Daniela Heard. I work as a researcher at the Asser Institute and as a consultant in the field of sport and human rights. Um, and as the event's subtitle, uh, is insights from research and practice. In the next 20 minutes, I'll try to do exactly that, share some insights from working as a researcher and consultant in the field of mega sporting events and human rights. 
I would like to start with some general remarks on mega sporting events and their legal complexities, uh, while being conscious of the fact that the panels later this afternoon, of course, will zoom in uh, on one of or some of these issues in more detail. Uh, but what I would like to say now is that mega sporting events like the Olympic and Paralympic Games, like the FIFA World Cup, the Commonwealth Games, UEFA's European Championships, and many others are very complex events from a number of perspectives, and in particular, when it comes to their human rights impacts. And on the one hand, we know that these events have a potential to promote uh, human rights and be a force for good, not only in the host country or the host city where, where the event takes place. Um, but on the other hand, we also know that these events often are linked to human rights abuses. And this has been documented extensively in the past decades by uh, NGOs and, and other organizations. And these abuses can be traced back to two different kinds of origins, I would argue. Firstly, they can happen as a result of actions taken um, in the context of organizing and delivering the event. And secondly, they can occur because the organization of the event actually facilitates the occurrence of human rights abuses that are linked to structural human rights issues present in a certain host country or city. So, for example, if a host country has weak labor laws or limited protections in place, it is very likely that uh, the delivery of such an event can facilitate labor rights abuses, as, as we know that quite a workforce is needed to stage the event. Uh, then, if due to the hosting of the event, uh, decisions are being made to move certain neighborhoods and relocate people, and this is not done with respect for their right to information and participation and compensation, then this would be an example for actions and decisions taken for a specific event that then lead to human rights abuses. Um, and this category also includes uh, abuses that can occur in the supply chain for such an event. Now, what we also know from research is that mega sporting events can have an adverse impact on the entire range of human rights, directly and indirectly. And examples for direct impacts include violations of freedom of expression and the right to information and participatory rights, as I already mentioned, but also privacy rights can be infringed, housing rights, uh, there can be instances of child labor or forced labor uh, or arbitrary arrest and, and other forms of discrimination. More indirect impacts can then occur actually as a consequence of these direct human rights abuses. So to go back to this example of, of uh, relocations and displacements, uh, when communities are forcefully evicted uh, to make room for infrastructure that's needed for a certain event, for instance, um, that as such is a human rights abuse that's directly related to the event, but it then as a consequence of this, people lose their livelihoods, access to education or participation in cultural, social life, then that can be considered uh, an indirect impact on, on human rights that's also linked to the event. Now, this also shows that a wide range of rights holders can be impacted, including specific groups that are more vulnerable, like, like children, for instance, or migrant workers, as we also already mentioned, and the, the panels later today will, will highlight that in, in more detail. And finally, what we also know is that these events, um, well, they go through certain stages of a, of a life cycle, and these human rights abuses can happen at all these stages. So starting from the bidding stage, continuing to the preparation stage, also during, during games time, there can be adverse human rights impacts, and even in the aftermath of an event. So in particular, when certain human rights harms uh, that occurred before or during the event have not been remedied, these adverse uh, human rights impacts continue to uh, even when the event has finished. The problem with addressing these cases is that, like I said, these events are highly complex operations involving a vast amount of diverse actors, which in one way or another contribute to staging the event from the hosting authorities to the international sports bodies that actually own these events to the event organizers, um, which usually include representatives of national sports bodies of the host countries, uh, the sponsors, contractors and subcontractors, volunteers and many more actors are involved in, in delivering mega sporting events. And they are all somehow 
linked to each other by contracts, by agreements. And this creates a very complex web of frameworks and laws that apply, not least because actually many of these actors are registered under and covered by different uh, domestic jurisdictions. And in that sense, these mega sporting events are truly multi-jurisdictional events, as it has been argued. What further adds to the complexity um, is that hosting these events often comes with a certain um, climate of exceptionalism. This also extends to the legal field. So in other words, in many cases, laws that usually apply under normal circumstances in host countries are abandoned or even temporarily suspended for the time that these events are, are being organized and delivered. Um, and that, for instance, happens to rights of citizens in the context of participating in decisions and their right to information in order to speed up processes and ensure that um, yeah, there's a smooth organization and running of the event. And it did happen. Uh, these, these, this has happened, for instance, in the context of uh, planned relocations and displacements um, of people in neighborhoods. And because of this plurality and, and also diversity of actors involved, you face what's been referred to as the problem of many, of many hands. And as a result of that, um, the lines of responsibility and accountability for actions taken in the context of staging these events, but also for the harms that occur uh, linked to these events uh, are blurred, which makes it very difficult for rights holders to understand what happened, to identify the responsible parties, and also to hold them to account. Um, and moreover, this can also facilitate uh, blame shifting between the different actors involved and even lead to some of these actors escaping their responsibility uh, entirely. Searching for ways to address uh, mega sporting event related human rights abuses, therefore, I argue, would also mean to tackle this issue of multiple and diverse actors coming together and jointly staging the event and eventually contributing to human rights abuses. And, and one way to go about this, as I have explored in my research, is adopting a shared responsibility approach to the organization of these events. And like the name suggests, uh, the idea of shared responsibility is to share uh, the responsibility between the different involved actors. I looked at this concept in a legal context mainly. So how to share legal responsibilities for a contribution to a harm, harm being the human rights abuse. Um, but what I realized is that this notion as such and in a more general meaning is actually quite present in the mega sporting event context and also the wider sport context in multiple ways. Um, for instance, um, when FIFA launched an oversight body to monitor um, the systems in place to ensure that decent working conditions are applied at the World Cup construction sites in Qatar, um, it made statements like uh, the one on the, on the slide. Uh, the full quote is, uh, labor, labor issues, especially in the construction sector, are a global challenge, and we need to understand er that everybody involved has a shared responsibility. Um, likewise, a study from the MSE platform for human rights uh, from back in 2016 uh, also stated that MSEs are a shared responsibility to and demand shared responses. And you can also find uh, a number of academic publications on the topic that actually speak of teamwork to address uh, adverse human rights impacts of MSEs. So while this is uh, this is there, this notion of shared responsibility. Uh, in practice, this idea seems barely implemented when it comes to human rights impacts. Generally, event organizers and sports bodies uh, usually have quite a clear understanding of the different tasks and responsibilities related to staging the event. Um, some organizers also have uh, or had what's called a responsibility matrix in place. Um, but this did not yet at least include responsibilities for respecting and protecting human rights in the context of organizing mega sporting events. And I would argue that to fully embrace a shared responsibility approach to human rights impacts of these events, that that would mean on the one hand to apply it from the outset, so in a preventative and forward-looking manner, which would clarify human rights responsibilities and make the organization of these events more transparent and help those affected uh, to understand who's responsible uh, for what. 
And on the other hand, um, I think it also would mean to apply this uh, in a retrospective way to ensure that when harm actually has happened, there are ways to hold all actors that contributed in one way or another to account based on their share of, of contribution to the harm and to also ensure that those affected have access to remedy. Now, access to remedy, um, I briefly want to highlight, is, is another challenge on its own in the sporting context more generally for many reasons. Um, one of them being that most available mechanisms in the sporting context have not been designed with uh, human rights harms in mind and therefore lack expertise or capacity. Um, and in the mega sporting event context, the challenge is that those mechanisms that are relevant and, and available usually have quite a limited scope and cover only specific types of actors involved. And there's no central mechanism that could be used to hold all actors to account. Um, and this, of course, provides significant obstacles for rights holders. If following this idea of shared responsibility, um, I would argue that a natural next step would be to also consider something that I would call collaborative remedy uh, in the absence of such a central mechanism. And what that could mean um, is that the different relevant mechanisms find a way to formally collaborate in those cases that clearly raise questions of shared responsibility and thereby avoid blame shifting and avoid that some of the actors escape responsibility and also ensure that the rights holders uh, do get compensated for the entire harm they suffered and not just parts of it, if, if any at all. Um, while these are all interesting ideas and concepts in theory and something to conduct further research on, we luckily do see things changing in practice um, with an evolving sport and human rights movement that, that reaches actually a number of stakeholders in the world of sport and beyond. Um, and even though this movement goes beyond mega sporting events, I think it's quite safe to say that the increased attention to human rights impacts of these events from the past decades and also the historical link of mega sporting events with human rights causes and, and protests and other social movements has actually helped this movement to gather speed. Um, the slide just presents really a very limited selection of important mo moments um, that helped to shape the movement as we know it today. Um, but what certainly had an influence on this are, were the campaigns by, by Human Rights Watch and other NGOs around the Beijing, uh, Beijing Olympic bid in 2000 and then the actual event in 2008, um, the awarding of the FIFA World Cup to Qatar in 2010, and certainly also the open letter sent by John Ruggi and Mary Robinson to then FIFA President Blatter urging FIFA to fully integrate human rights considerations into its decision-making uh, in 2014. Uh, that certainly helped FIFA, um, or it certainly helped to bring FIFA on the human rights journey and, and sparked also broader discussions on the human rights issues in the world of sport. Um, and what we also see that for these discussions, the framework provided by the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights according to which a sport body has a responsibility to respect human rights, provides a common reference point and, and slowly finds increasing acceptance in the sporting world. Um, so today we see proof of that movement in different areas of the sports ecosystem from measures taken by different international sports bodies, such as including human rights provisions in event bidding regulations or other sport-related regulations. Um, and the IOC also announced uh, that it will finalize its human rights strategy by, I think, September this year, uh, which is also based on the framework provided by the UN Guiding Principles. In addition, there are developments on the national level. Um, the German Football Association being one of the first to uh, follow FIFA with adopting human rights policy. Um, we also know that a lot of national football teams have made statements in the past in relation to uh, the workers and, and migrant uh, workers' rights in Qatar. Um, but there are also other discussions being held and negotiations by international and regional intergovernmental organizations to, to adopt policies. 
um, then we do see quite some initiatives for uh, the establishment of safe sport entities on national levels. Um, we also see a rise in athlete representative bodies. And we do see continuing and perhaps even more pressure from civil society with, with more organizations like trade union and athletes union uh, unions integrating the topic of sport and human rights, uh, conducting studies on this. And in this case, not only on, on mega sporting events and human rights anymore, but also linked to human rights issues linked to day to day sports is a topic that's increasingly being picked up. Um, in research, um, and yeah, we do see organizations like the Center for Sport and Human Rights emerging and growing. Um, my final remarks, um, I would like to make in relation to the importance of making this movement sustainable uh, and ensuring that future generations working in the world of sport uh, or related fields can actually consolidate these recent developments. And I think uh, key here is uh, education um, and education on the primary, secondary, uh, tertiary and also professional level. Um, so all around, basically, um, it starts with primary education, using sport there to teach human rights values. Um, for instance, using physical exercise, uh, which is an integral part of the education. Uh, to teach human rights values in the form of fair play, equality, and non-discrimination is certainly feasible and probably already happening without being explicitly linked to, to the human rights framework. But this certainly can be continued and expanded in secondary education, where additional emphasis uh, could be put on the broader human rights risks related to sport in form of what is actually expected behavior, what constitutes harm and how can we prevent and, and address it. And then certainly at, at university level, uh, university studies and other educational programs after school provide quite a lot of room, uh, I would argue, for integrating this topic of sport and human rights. Um, and there you have these both sides. You have human rights related study programs where sport is barely mentioned, uh, neither as a risk to human rights, nor as an opportunity to advance and promote human rights. Um, and the same is actually true the other way around for the variety of sport related programs that exist. So sport management, sport history, sport law, sport policy, sport sociology, and, and more. Um, there's also barely any mention of, of human rights there. Um, however, we do see that that is slowly changing. So, for instance, there are quite some sport ethics integrity programs or sport law programs that have started to pick up the issue of human rights as a subtopic, for instance, with guest lectures specifically dedicated to the topic or entire courses even being set up. Um, and the same is also true for, for professional education. You do see more and more workshops and webinars on the topics coming by. And also uh, this year, actually, the first for the first time, a summer school for professionals on sport and human rights is organized by the ASLO Institute and the Hague in collaboration with the Center for Sport and Human Rights and FIFPRO. And I'm happy to provide more information in the chat later on this particular program. Um, but in addition to education, another means to make this movement more sustainable, I think, is to also um, conduct more research. Uh, and there really is more room and also need for research into the different areas that are linked to sport and human rights, um, to have an evidence base that then helps to call for change and, and improvements. Um, currently, much of the work that's out there, uh, studies, articles, books, rely quite heavily on studies by NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Transparency International, Amnesty International, UNICEF, and more. Um, and this can and should be supported by scientific research or in collaboration um, in those areas where there's a clear lack of research. And just to give you some examples, um, we know, for instance, less on human rights impacts of single sport events, or smaller sport events, or e-sport events. Um, there's also no comprehensive research on how women and girls are um, impacted differently by mega sporting events. Uh, and we also know less about how mega sporting events could 
best be used to actually promote human rights. And also more generally uh, related to sports, day-to-day -day sports, um, there is a lack of research. For instance, there's no comprehensive database on safeguarding policies and their effectiveness or, or on available remedy mechanisms um, and how they work and how, whether they are effective or not. And this shows once again, um, I think that the issue of mega sporting events and human rights has grown into much wider considerations of the human rights risks, but also opportunities linked to sports. Um, and I do hope that indeed through education and also more research and events like the one today, um, the negative impacts of mega sporting events and sports can be further minimized and the potential to promote human rights um, better realized in the future. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the rest of uh, the afternoon. Thank you very much, Daniela. That was, that was fantastic. A really lovely summary of the sorts of issues that I think we're going to, that are currently taking place within this, the sphere of mega events um, and human rights, and also some of the issues that I think we're going to continue to discuss um, for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I'm going to just now move on to some questions and some and some discussion. Um, uh, I'll start just by asking one, and then I know there are a couple of questions in, in, in the in the question and answer already, and encourage others who have listened to Daniela's uh, presentation to then consider questions, and I will then post them to you. So, I guess I was interested in the the, the life cycle component um, that you mentioned early on, Daniela, in terms of. Um, and I guess the question is how how important is it that component um, is introduced, and at the earliest stages we really think about enshrining these human rights obligations and requirements because the danger, and I think it relates to your remedy point of if they're not in at the beginning, if they're not enshrined at that stage, then it's much more difficult to to succeed and to secure those kind of improvements that we're looking at. So how how important is that earliest stage of the life cycle? Very important to be very brief in my answer, but uh, I'll explain why. Um, so I think the first reason is because also in the bidding stage, in the very early stage, there is a potential for human rights abuses to happen. And um, just one example is, for instance, uh, for the Beijing Olympics um, back then, when the IOC evaluation committee was visiting town, um, the government made sure that there are no signs of any problems in, in, the, in the city, which meant that um, there were arbitrary arrests happening and, and homeless people and children were just arrested to, to be locked up. Uh, there were rumors that people were told to not switch on any heating in order to make the air clean and nice. So there, there are a lot of issues that can also come up in the bidding stage already. And another reason why it's also important is because in the bidding stage, this is where the organizers really um, plan and define also the vision for the event and where there is the most negotiations happening and I think also the most leverage for um, the event owners to then actually say okay these are our requirements and these are the requirements you need to fulfill so there is a big big opportunity to then say uh, parts of our requirements are actually uh, human rights requirements and, and we want to know how you as the organizer um, will ensure that human rights are protected and respected throughout the entire cycle of the event. Um, I think in my own research, I actually argued that from a human rights perspective, the most risky stage is actually the preparation stage. Um, and it's, that is because really, I think there the most severe abuses can happen. But if you really look at the potential of, of really protecting human rights, then um, indeed the, the bidding stage is also key and extremely important. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, the, there's a question from the in the Q and A about: Do you think mega sporting events can act as agents for change and putting pressure on event owners to ensure they adhere to human rights responsibilities? Yeah, I think that that connects nicely to, to what I just said now. So I, I certainly believe that. And that's also why I think it's the argument of saying that only certain countries should be allowed to host these events is, is difficult, if you, especially if you consider this, because um, there is a potential to use these events to make sure that 
the discussion on human rights and, and a better protection of human rights in a certain host country is, is, is started and people are actually engaging with it. And um, I know that Qatar is very controversial, but I do think that that is one example where you can really see what the attention um, that, that awarding the event to such a country, what that actually brought about for, for uh, changes when it really comes to you know, legal changes uh, on, on the labor laws, um, of course, the, the discussion on how effective that is in practice and on the ground and the implementation and enforcement is a different one. But um, in that sense, the, the power that these events have and also the event owners by, you know, imposing certain um, framework for how these events should be staged and the room that is given for, for them to including human rights requirements uh, really makes the case for saying that, you know, these events can be an agent for, for change and can exercise quite some pressure and then at least start the conversation on it. Um, what I think will be very interesting to see, especially in the Qatar cases, what happens when the event stops. Yeah. So that's, yeah, what happens to, in case there were positive changes introduced, what happens then when the event is, is over? Yeah. Yeah, the, the there's a couple there's a there's a comment uh, and then a question. So the comment is uh, related to your education uh, discussion. So um, Zara Grant talks about national human rights institutions are doing great work on areas of sport and human rights education. Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission has hosted sessions in schools and worked with the Irish Football Association with youth in prisons. So sort of, a sort of focus on what you suggested that education is a really important space and and again a range of actors there can can play a role. And the question um, from Lucia is, do you think it could be an option to include a human rights index as a minimum standard, for example, the whole city contract for Olympic Games? So uh, is, it, is it an option to include a human rights index as a minimum standard? Um, I think the problem here is that, that I would want to see the human rights index. That's the right one to be used. Um, so. And then again, if, if you do that, the, the problem will be that probably this potential that uh, organizing an event has to bring um, advancements uh, when it comes to human rights standards and protection, that, that will probably then, then be gone because it will um, exclude a lot of countries. And, and to be very fair, um, I think there's no country in the world with a clean slate when it comes to human rights issues. So I, I do find that rather problematic, but um, I think only because it would be such a su such a general uh, by default kind of thing. If if you rather use these um, bidding um, regulations to be very explicit about what is expected, and and these regulations they turn into hard law contractual obligations, I think then you really can um, yeah have much bigger effects uh, with that. So that's why I would find such an index a bit problematic. Okay, really good. There's a couple of really uh, good questions uh, coming in. Um, from Gabrielle Coventry, there's increasing debate about the role of spectators in the media in the sports human rights debate, i.e. in giving legitimacy to events and boycotting, etc. What role would you think they play in a shared responsibility model? Definitely also a role. So I think um, another group of actors that I didn't mention in my presentation now, but that I also looked at in my research, not in much detail, but definitely worth considering is, is of course, the broadcasters. And we do see that, you know, in the past um, couple of years, there have been instances where um, certain broadcasters actually did decide, for instance, to do a short coverage of the human rights situation in certain host countries. And I think thereby contributing to at least raising awareness and, and hopefully ensuring that um, each and every actor that is involved is at least aware of, of their share in, in contribution uh, of their share of responsibility when it comes to um, yeah, advancing human rights, protecting them, respecting them. I do think that with the media in general and broadcasters in, in, in particular, um, there is less of a role uh, there um, directly when it comes to this retrospective function of shared responsibility uh, when the harm has happened to then say, um, you know, there's a certain share of responsibility that the media or the broadcasters have. Of course, there can be specific cases where this might be the case. But where I do think they are important is to, to 
uh, uncover the facts. Because that, as such, is, is another very difficult issue very often, like I said, because so many actors are involved, uh, so many things happen, um, which makes it difficult for outsiders then or, or third parties that are being harmed in the process to understand how did this harm happen, how did that all come about, um, and having the support of media to, to yeah, collect facts or report on facts um, can be very important and, and powerful, of course. Great, and there's a there's a really great question that's quite challenging uh, from Mahmoud <laughs> Amara from Qatar University. Is there a consensus within international sport the international sports community about the definition of human rights in sport? What is the role of international sport organisations to work towards a shared value around human rights, at least within the sporting context? Yeah, that is a very challenging question indeed. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I'll try to answer this a bit based on my own background. So I come from a uh, yeah classic international law human rights uh, education, and, and this is also how I approach the, the issue and the topic and my entire research um, using, you know, the International Bill of Human Rights. But at the same time, something that is super important that comes up uh, a lot also in the sporting context is this idea of localizing human rights. So really looking at um, local context, cultural context, uh, what are the specifics here? And, and that is also important when we talk about events and, and sports um, in general. Um, I think there are challenges to define what is uh, what are human rights in sport, but also in general sports as a human right. So the human right to sport, yes, but also if we zoom in, certain issues um, are very difficult to define or people use different kind of definitions. For instance, the whole discussion around transgender athletes, um, it's very difficult to then come to a consensus. Um, from my work as a consultant, I also know that um, there are attempts being made to come up with, with like a common reference point and, and a glossary of these terms. But yeah, th that is challenging. I do think it's important to at least have this, this common reference point and, and make sure that when we discuss and talk about these issues that everybody is on the same page and knows what we actually mean and what the understanding is. But like I said, at the same time, um, yeah, these local contexts, um, they need to be respected and also understood if you really want to have uh, an impact. Brilliant. So I think we've probably got time for one question. There's another question come in here from Nicola Kidd. Um, and it is, how can these types of frameworks for MSE human rights be implemented in countries where extreme marginalization and oppressive treatment already exists? And she gives the example of Rio Favelas. Uh, how does one size fit all? Yeah, it, it doesn't, um, but it has to kind of, because I feel like these these contracts and these regulations, they are a very powerful means that we have. And, and this is really connected, really nicely connected to, to my, my previous point that I made. Um, I do think it's important to understand what are the issues from, from the start. And then during the bidding phase, during these negotiations, um, you can try to exercise as much leverage as possible as, as the event owner in particular, I think, um, but also civil society groups on the ground that are aware of the fact that a certain city or a certain country is bidding for an event to make sure that, and that the issues that are there are on the agenda, that they are being addressed um, and that the agreements that are entered into, that they actually cover these issues and that they can be used then to make progress um, or at least not any harm or additional harm on some of these issues. But I see there also the difficulty that I faced in my research um, with this distinction between human rights abuses that are brought about by the staging and the, the, the delivery of the event. And then on the other side, human rights issues that are already present as a structural issue in a host country uh, or city, and that can then be facilitated by having this event. Um, so it's, it's, I think, very important to make sure that both of these scenarios are somehow covered in, in these um, agreements. Okay. Uh, just a little quick one, just before we finish, and again, it's related to that point I think you touched on around about hosting in events in countries with already existing human rights issues. So 
you know, do you think that hosting, not hosting in those countries is a, is a realistic proposition and or a good thing? Or are you of the mind that actually this shines a light and therefore it does, it is an opportunity actually to progress human rights related uh, agenda? Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I don't think, um, I don't think this will be um, a solution. Um, of course, the risks will be minimized if you uh, follow bids where all the infrastructure, for instance, is already in place and not much construction has to happen, uh, where you know that um, structural human rights issues that are present in the country are, are limited. But, but like we said already, um, it can be a missed opportunity. Um, but it's a risky statement, of course, because, of course, in the end, all human rights abuses have, should be prevented in the best case. Um, so going to these countries while knowing that there are issues is, is always more risky than deciding for, for other countries. Um, and I do think that the Qatar case um, will help us to understand that a bit better and will also provide us with more information, um, not only now and when the event happens, but also I think uh, we need to closely monitor what happens after the event. because. That will, I think, be the crucial moment and also the crucial um, indicator for, you know, really understanding then, um, is it worth it? Um, do we see lasting change? Um, so does these kind of uh, uh, awardings uh, make sense? Yeah, from a human rights perspective, obviously. That's, that's fantastic, Danielle. I'm going to bring it to a close now. That's been a, a fantastic start to the, to the symposium.